Hi uh, Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is going to be a wrap up of my recent fiction reads the last week or so. So we have The Canal by Lee Rourke. We have The Largesse of the Sea Maiden by Dennis Johnson. And we have Camilla Shamsi's Women's Fiction Prize winning 2018 Home Fire. We'll start with the Lee Rourke, The Canal. Now books about boredom, and for that matter films about boredom, normally bore me. But this bucked the trend. So uh, the main character is a man who sort of fires in a resignation letter to his uh, job. He's sort of fed up with the, the, the routine. And he goes and spends most of his day uh, sitting on a bench by a canal in North London between Islington and Hackney, I think, uh, where he sort of stares at the bird life. He stares at the litter and the graffiti. He stares at the planes overhead. He seems to have a great knowledge of, of airliners. And uh, he watches a few sort of passers-by, including a gang of four youths. And uh, he stares at uh, a sort of an all-glass office building in which he can see through the glass to the, uh, the uh, wage slaves. Uh, although they're modern-day wage slaves, they all have computer monitors. Um, and... After a couple of full starts where uh, the mad and the drunk come and sit next to him on the bench and sort of hold their own uh, conversations with him that, that, that don't include him at all, uh, one day this beautiful woman comes and sits next to him. And they fall into a pattern of regular meetings on here, but she's very much in control as to what can and can't be said. She holds all the power, partly, of course, a sexual power over him, but it's not just that. And... He notices uh, that one of the things she does is she's staring at the office building uh, as much as, as he does, but she seems to be watching or one particular person uh, in particular. And gradually sort of uh, event, events move on. But I th what I found really interesting about this book was, was the attitude of the woman. Because they both felt that admitting that life was boring and one was bored was far more honest than, you know, sort of trying to um, distract oneself through work, through pleasures. But she seemed to take it on uh, to a, a greater level than he did, in that she admitted, not admitted, well, yes, admitted, I suppose, that she had a sort of some kind of sort of attraction to suicide bombers and terrorists, because she reckoned what they did, they did out of boredom as well, only they so sort of recognised the sort of void in their life, and they so rejected that that they wanted to sort of go out in a, you know, in a sort of terrifying and terrible way. And it's a very interesting psychology. It's not one I'd come across before, a sort of sexual fantasy attraction to, to, to that, sort of, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and that's, you know, that's, you know, I'm not going to give a spoiler as to how, how, how the book builds, other than to say uh, the one thing that uh, I suppose was a slight flaw was that one of the symbols of the sort of regular routine and a sign of beauty aesthetic beauty in the world which seems to exist only for itself as a beautiful thing not something that was of any value outside of its beauty i knew what the fate of that symbol would become in the book so i did guess that um but i think what's int also interesting is is that the youths i mean basically the youths are uh as as sort of you know uh, estate years will be they're sort of quite threatening and menacing and uh, unwittingly the male character manages to sort of provoke an interaction with them in which he doesn't he doesn't come off well but what I loved about them was the way Rourke had written them they were like an old-fashioned Greek chorus it, there were four of them and one would say something and the four would sort of echo it but slightly the language would be slightly changed so the sentiment of the what of the line was exactly the same as the previous ones but each one had a slight individuality. And I, I just thought that was sort of great writing, really. So, you know, this book was far from boring, although it was a sort of a treatise into modern life and boredom and the things we do to distract ourselves. And the sort of, you know, the lack of control we have, really, over events. So it was a, it was a good read. So next we have The Largesse of the Sea Maiden by Dennis uh, Johnson. These were uh, short stories, the last book of his that was published before he died. I was recommended these by Curtis Books and Books, 
who, uh, amongst other people, had been extolling Johnson. I'd, I'd never really sort of come across Johnson at all, so I asked Curtis which I should start with by way of introduction, and he said this. And I'm very glad he did. Uh, oh, I, sorry, I won't say it. That was 4.5 stars, sorry. Uh, this was five stars. And in the post-read uh, email exchange with Curtis, she said, oh, you know, don't forget to say on this video what, you know, which was your favourite story. Uh, and the answer is, they were all equally good. I mean, this is just sublime writing. I've had a bit of a downer on short stories this year. I, I, I've sort of avoided them. I started off with Carmen Maria Machado's Her Body and Other Parties. And I did a full video uh, using that to say, well, what makes a good short story collection? Why are they so uneven in quality? Why is so often the best story plays first and it's all downhill from there? And I'll post a link to, to, to that sort of meditation on the short story. And I read that in January and I sort of avoided short stories pretty much since. Not because of Mikado, but just the whole thing of, I think it's really hard to make a collection of short stories that, that, that you know, holds up and is strong throughout and Johnson showed me that you know it is possible so just going through each of the stories so the first one is called The Largest of the Sea Maiden and um, it starts off with a dinner party and it's that sort of you know free association of ideas as people bounce off each other it's not they've all broken up into separate conversations so I'm, ju I'm just going to read this um, we sat around in the living room describing the loudest sounds we'd ever heard one said it was his wife's voice when she told him she didn't love him anymore and wanted a divorce. Another recalled the pounding of his heart when he suffered a coronary. Tia Jones had become a grandmother at the age of 37 and hoped never again to hear anything so loud as her granddaughter crying in her 16-year-old daughter's arms. Her husband Ralph said it hurts his ears whenever his brother opened his mouth in public because his brother had Tourette syndrome and erupted with remarks like, I masturbate, your penis smells good in front of perfect strangers on a bus, or during a movie, or even in church. <laughs> and so simply and economically, as Johnson given a, a sort of a, a tableau of these different character types, and the rest of the story is the sort of interactions, and a beautifully touching, poignant ending, which completely uh, I didn't see coming. And what the rest of the story is, it is, so they start off talking about, you know, loud noises, and then the rest of it is, is consideration of silences and quiet quiet fleeting moments in life and it's, it's just brilliantly written so that's the first story the second story is called the largest of the sea maidens the, the eponymous title of the book and this is a this is a, a brilliantly rendered story so it's a guy who's in a clinic for alcohol addiction he's been to the you know several different clinics and part of his therapy is family therapy on a Sunday in which family members are invited to attend. And his grandmother had shown up and basically uh, accused all the addicts of being possessed by Satan because of her religious beliefs. And the rest of the time, he, spent, he is encouraged to write letters to everyone in his life who he is affected through his addiction and bad behaviour. But these letters will never be sent. And so he writes to his brothers and his sisters and you begin to get a picture of the broken family life. Uh, he writes to his grandmother, uh, but increasingly he writes sort of you know he writes to the doctors talking about his uh, the, the the medication that they've given him and also his visions and he starts writing to Satan um, and it's just again brilliantly brilliantly rendered sort of insight into a state of a broken mind and then uh, the third one is uh, sorry that's called Starlight of Idaho that wasn't uh, the largest of the sea maiden because that was the first story sorry that was called the starlight of idaho uh third was strangler bob in which a guy uh, is put into county jail awaiting trial for some petty offense and most people in there are there for petty offenses uh and he hooks up with two other guys and you know they, they sort of become like the three musketeers but his bunkmate is the guy called strangler bob and Strangler Bob predicts that, although they're only in for petty crime, each of them in their own way will end up committing a murder at some point in their life. Uh, and it's brilliant. And, I, you know, I don't want to spoil it again. Uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, it's, a, it's, again, it's, well, it's just perfectly sublime and well executed. I mean, the, the economy and yet the depth of sort of humanity that, that he portrays is, is so satisfying. The fourth story is called Triumph Over the Grave. And this was really interesting. It's a, it's a literary writer. And he's basically a psychopomp. He keeps sort of helping, 
you know, terminally ill friends and acquaintances. You know, he accompanies them in their last hours. Um, and it is, it is a meditation on death. Um, he sort of seems to remain untouched. You know, he's of a similar age to a lot of these people. Um, but he seems to remain untouched and, and undecayed. So a bit of a sort of Dorian Gray thing going on there. Um, but the end, again, just beautifully just you know he doesn't do any sort of gross literary twist where the whole world of the previous story or the story previous to the ending is you know inverted like life of pi for example he just does a little twist that just beautifully sort of changes the perspective and that you know that is a fabulous story and then the last story is called doppelganger poltergeist which has a remarkable achievement it's about a conspiracy theory about elvis presley and his dead twin who died at birth by a character who is a twin, uh, who was a poetry teacher and lecturer. And his star pupil was also a twin. And he's got it in his head that, the, that Elvis's twin didn't really die. And, and, you know, why that accounts for there being two Elvises, the, the pre-Elvis, the, you know, the, the sexual magnet, rock and roll, you know, sort of summoner of passions who then went into the army and came out a completely sort of neutered guy who ended up dying on the toilet you know from sort of you know feeding himself to death um now i don't like elvis presley and the music of elvis presley and all of that you know, that, that that stood for and the veneration of him and yet the writing is so good that you know i was totally engaged into this story and i was you know i've totally wanted to see how it would work out um and the last thing I'm going to say about this wonderful collection is, um, so this is a line from uh, Doppelganger Poltergeist, and it's it's um, it's the the poetry teacher uh, and critic talking to his star pupil, who's called Ahern. At five second intervals, he nodded. He neither supported nor contradicted me when I said that Ahern was a poet and the others were congenital mediocrities that our writing program amounted to an academic Ponzi scheme. A literary racket. I just think that's brilliant because that's how I see creative writing that you turn out all these writers uh, who are probably not going to be good enough because you can't teach writing you know it's got to come from in here from your personal vision um, and, and you turn out all these writers who are destined like you know struggling actors to never make it as writers never make a living uh, and it is like a Ponzi scheme or what we here in the UK call a pyramid selling scheme um, Fantastic. I mean, you know, this is just superlative. So I'm going to read one of his novels next. I think it's called Sea Train. Uh, I haven't actually bought it. And on to Camilla Shamsey, Home Fire, which my wife, this is my wife's copy because she's reading it for her book club. Um, uh, full disclosure, uh, I have written a novel in 2011 and published it uh, about a homegrown terrorist, uh, Islamic fundamentalist terrorist, uh, which is pretty much the themes uh, of this book. So, uh, you know, I know a lot about that subject. I've, re um, I've researched it and I have quite strong feelings about it. I'm not going to say what my take on my own work was or what informed, you know, I'm simply throwing that out there as a context for what I go on to say here, which you may or may not, you know, include when you, you, you know, in, in your consideration of what I go on to say about this book. So this is a book of ideas, basically, and I think it has two or three really interesting ideas. And the first is about the role that gender plays in the process of um, grooming and converting people into sort of fundamentalists. Um, so there are three, there are three siblings. Uh, there's the older sister, Isma, and then there's twins, younger twins, uh, called Anika and Parvez. And their father was a jihadist who fought in Bosnia and Chechenia, and I think Kashmir was the third, and died in strange circumstances, possibly on the way to um, Guantanamo, or maybe he was killed during torture in Bagram Air Base in Iraq. Uh, so they've been through as children, they've been through that whole sort of being vetted by the security services in Britain because of the activities of their father. And the sins of the father are revisited uh, on this generation. Uh, and it sort of happens again. Uh, and the grooming, and, and so the two ideas are the grooming is, is based around gender. And it's also looking at, you know, well, you're not, you're not, you're not born genetically uh, a terrorist. 
but you you acquire a disposition for it because of your uh, social uh, circumstances and your family circumstances. So in the same way that you know in Israel when they you know when they used to um, after a suicide bomber they used to go and bulldoze the family home. Now. You know, that's supposed to be some sort of deterrent, but it isn't. All it does is it, it ensures that the children growing up in that home that gets demolished, you know, they've lost their father or mother to a suicide bomb and now they've had their house demolished. So, that you know, it's going to continue it through the generations, basically. Um, and and that sort of is one of the, you know, the factors here. He's not genetically constituted to be a terrorist, but the way of his conversion is they play on, and this comes to the gender part, so he has no father. He has no father figure. He is very much brought up by his older sister and his twin sister. And this is how the jihadis get to him. They basically say, he, they've emasculated you. You know, you need, to, you need to become the hero that your father was. You need to become a man. And that is the appeal that, you know, that, that they win him over by. And, and the, the device of this is that the sisters... You know, their economic circumstances change and the sisters say, we're going to have to sell the house. One's moving to America to study. The other one's quite happy. She decides that she's going to go off. So they don't need the house. Or, you know, and, and the jihadi groomers goes, well, you know, it's your house. You're the male. You know, you own it. You know, it's your house. Don't let them sell it from under you. So I think gender and generation is much more significant in consideration of how this grooming process works. And when Parvi's the son is actually in Raqqa, in IS, um, he's not a fighter, he's part of the media department. Um, so in a way, interestingly, he doesn't sort of become the great hero. He's very much a back, a backroom boy. But anyway, he, you know, the thing that appalls him most about life there is there's no love in it because he realises the harsh rule of Islamic law that, you know, the fat women are very much second class citizens and, you know, can't leave the house without a male escort. And this whole thing about, you know, uh, women's sex slaves and also, you know, choosing bride, you know, Islamic brides and, uh, you know, has to be through the marriage bureau and all of that sort of stuff. He, realized, you know, that's not love. He realises that. And what the love he had was the love of his sisters who cared for him. And, and that's what he sac sacrificed. So, you know, the, 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 the stuff about gender in here, I think, is really, really well done. But there's lots of problems with it, with this book, mainly around plot and mainly around style. Um, one of the things that, that's attached to this book is that it's a retelling of the Antigone story, the ancient classic Greek play Antigone. And it's in there, uh, but it doesn't appear until page 190 uh, out of 260. So, you know, well out two thirds of the way through. So the whole book is not a retelling of the Antigone story. The Antigone uh, idea or metaphor, which is of a sister who is prevented from burying her dead brother uh, because he is seen to be a betrayer of the country, so they won't give him any land in the country to be buried in. And I think that's brilliantly done in here as an, as an association. Except the sister in here, who's trying to bury a, a family member, She's not a liter, you know, at no stage is Shanti suggested that she's of literary bent. Therefore, the references to Antigone have come from the author. They haven't come from within any of the characters in the book. So it is a strange imposition or association that has no context. So the idea of it is very good because it's that notion of, well, you know, if you're, if a citizen declares war on the state that he derives from, such as going to join IS and fighting against the state he's from, is, you know, if he then gets stripped of his original citizenship, he can't be buried there, even though his family is still there living, you know, legal lives and peaceful lives. Um, so as a, as a sort of political idea, that's very strong. But as a literary idea, it's not rooted at all. So that's one of the problems. The second problem is the characters, as I said, so there's Isma, the older sister, who has the first chapter and then almost disappears from the book. Then we have chapters of the two respective twins, the, the Anika and uh, Parves. And in between that, we have a chapter of a character called um, Eamon, uh, which is a sort of Irish, <laughs> Irish abide version of a, of a Muslim name. And he is the son of an ambitious um, Muslim politician who has basically, at every stage of his political career, ditched his sort of Muslim sort of 
ness to become more English than the English and periodically will sort of overtly distance himself from anything to do with sort of Muslim life and culture and has married uh, a non-Muslim, married an American heiress. And Eamon is a, is a wastrel to some extent. He's not working. He's, he's, you know, he doesn't have to work. He has lots of money or access to lots of money. And at, early on in the book, his father goes from being an MP to being the Home Secretary. That is someone who has responsibility for all things to do with terrorism and citizenship and visas and foreign travel and all that stuff. You know, Homeland Security of the US. And so Eamon, you know... I think you could probably predict the plot device uh, that revolves around Amon when his father becomes the Home Secretary. I'm not going to spell it out. I'm not going to spoil it, but it's not, you know, it's not subtle. Um, and he becomes involved with Anika. That, that's all I'm going to say. Um, Anika is a slightly curious character because she is very sexually liberated and very sexually forward, uh, but she's also you know, it's quite devout. So her sister. Um, Isma is, is sort of pious and straight-laced and quite spinsterish, whereas uh, Anika is sort of as pious, but but much more sort of willing to compromise aspects of it. She picks and chooses, really. Um, but that you know, the the problem becomes when, and then the final chapter is given to the Home Secretary, the father of Amon, and the problem is as a study of you know what what lies behind. Uh, grooming and militant Islam and all this stuff, all that sort of stuff. It's far more interesting when it's ordinary people. But when the book becomes about Eamon, and when, more importantly when it comes about his father, the Home Secretary, that's far less involving engaging because as mere, mere mortals, we can't project ourselves into the, in, into the lives of these, you know, so, you know, as bigger than human characters who rule over our fates. And interestingly, this book is dedicated, I think. Uh, yes, for Gillian Slovo, who's another author, South African origin but lives in Britain, who wrote one of the worst books I've ever read. It was on the 2011 riots, mainly in London, but sort of uh, throughout England. And she cited that book entirely amongst the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary and the head of the Metro Metropolitan Police. There was one writer made an appearance in the whole book and he was pulling someone from a burning building, not destroying property. And she, you know, that book was about the playing out of, of you know, of the riots, which were very much sort of grassroots, you know, anger and fury and rebellion and rejection of authority. She ignored all of that. And she went to the high politics of the politicians and their machinations. And this book moves into the same territory by the end. And it's much more concerned about that level, than what's happening on the ground in these, you know, communities and cities up and down the, the land, where, for me, the interest is. Um, and I think, I think the book misses a trick there. I really do. Um, I'm not interested in some fictional notion of the Home Secretary and, you know, trying to marry the personal and the political, because we can't, you know... It's very hard to do that in fiction because these are sort of slightly larger than lives. I'm not going to say they're superheroes because they're pretty morally repugnant, you know, these politicians. It can be done. I mean, Jonathan Friedland wrote a book called To Kill a President, which basically contains Trump and Bannon. But they were not the prime movers. They were only ever sort of referred to by the actions of others. And the protagonist was a, was a sort of investigator stroke secret service homeland security person who was much more humble much more sympathetic for us to view what was going on in this plot to kill the American president. So even though it was about high politics, it was mediated and interpreted by someone much more humble, which the start of this book you think is going to be the same, but actually it isn't at all. It's about Eamon as the son of the Home Secretary, and it's about the Home Secretary. And we lose sight of, apart from the Antigone story, we lose sight of the much more humble and mundane and ordinary people who this book, I think, should have been about. Um, and then finally, I just want to talk about some stylistic things which really irritated me. So in terms of his, in terms of sort of accuracy, you know, on the one hand, she writes a really interesting line where Isma is, is going to America where she's got a sort of an academic placement, but she's being grilled in the British airport that she's flying out from because of the history of her father being a terrorist. 
and they go through all her stuff and Isma feels sort of degraded and, and sort of says, you know, the fingerprints of the person searching are on my on my undergarments. And you think, yeah, God, you know, that, that is an invasion too far. But then you think about it. If they're searching for explosives or they're searching for poison in the gusset of her underwear, they'd be wearing gloves. So there will be no imprint. So it doesn't work. So she's managed to undermine what was actually quite a quite an interesting, you know, line. And, you know, she does that again and again. She keeps offering you sort of opposites and you have to decide, you know, which is it. So here's here's an example of of where she offers you a thing and then it's opposite. That was the only word for this sense of such enormous loss where there had been so very little there to lose. Well, which is it? Is it an enormous loss or is it sort of literary overblownness that actually there's no loss at all, but we're going to use this sort of grandiose emotional statement. Here's another one. Isma looked at her reflection in the mirror. Hair texturised into beachy waves, as Mona of Persophilus Hair in Wembley had promised when she recommended a product that could counter frizzy flyaway, flyaway hair without attaining the miracle of straightening it. Her hair said, playful and surprising. Or it would if it didn't come attached to her face. I just think that's poor writing. Her hair said, playful and surprising. Well, you know, I'm not sure about that. Um, or it would if it didn't come attached to her face. So again, she's sort of undermining, you know, this sort of, she's offering us without telling us which it is, which is fine, you don't have to spell it out. But then she's sort of undermining it with a sort of, over-explaining it. You know, I offer you this metaphor, playful hair, surprising hair, but actually it was neither. I just don't think that works. Um, and then she talks about, you know, the, the meaningful of sort of saying prayers or hearing prayers. This rocking motion that accompanied her prayers was her grandmother rocking her to sleep, whispering these verses to protect her. Uh, at first, the words were just a language she didn't know, but as she continued, closing her eyes to shut out the world, they burrowed inside her, flared into light, dispelled the darkness, and then the light softened, diffused, enveloping her in the peace that comes from knowing her own powerlessness. Well, I think that's lovely. I think that's great writing. Straight away, next paragraph. At least that's how it usually worked. But today she couldn't make them anything other than words in a foreign language, spoken out loud in a room that didn't anticipate anyone being out from under the covers at this hour, and so was too cold. So she's given us this beautiful metaphor, this beautiful lyrical poetic writing about the effect of her grandmother saying prayers to her as a child. And then she's completely undermined it by saying, well, it's not like that today. Uh, uh, and she does this time and time again, and I think it's a really poor device. And then another thing. So the last section of the book sort of, you know, starts to have sort of the media portrayal of the events and Twitter stuff. And she sort of, you know, comes back with, um, you know, imaginary hashtags in reaction to the events. But one of the things she does is a sort of a tabloid newspaper report. Pervy Pasha's twin sister engineered sex tryst with Home Secretary's son. That's the headline. Anika, inverted commas, Nikas Pasha, the 19-year-old twin sister of Muslim fanatic Parvez Pervy Pasha, has been revealed as her brother's accomplice. She hunted down the Home Secretary's son, Eamon, 24, and used sex to try and brainwash him into convincing his father to allow her terrorist brother back in England. Nickers kept her true identity hidden from her lover until hours before her twin brother was fortunately killed while trying to enter the British consulate in Istanbul, etc, etc, etc. OK, now that is obviously a jaundiced, politically biased portrayal of events. The book is more subtle than that. It gives other versions according to who the character is, you know, of, of what these events, what actually lay behind these events. But, you know... Tabloid newspapers sort of send themselves up. So to sort of send up a tabloid sending itself up doesn't add any value, doesn't bring any value. You know, we could imagine how it would portray. You probably just need the, the headline, which was Pervy Pasha's twin sister engineered sex tryst with Home Secretary's son. And you didn't need, she didn't then need to do the exercise of what that article might look like. 
And again, this brings me to, to an overall flaw of she's got these great ideas and the Antigone vehicle sort of works, but it's not the whole novel. But ultimately, the characters represent positions. The three siblings represent different versions of Islam. The Home Secretary ver represents another uh, version of, of turning your back on Islam so, you know, so fundamentally to become more British than the British, as it were. Now, these are legitimate things to consider and to discuss, but they never rise above the character, you know, true deep characterization. It's, you know, the characters are badly written with the examples I just gave before, plus they represent positions. Therefore, I don't think it best serves the ideas that she, you know, represents in this book, because the characters are just mouthpieces for ideas. They're not real in deep characters, in depth characters. Um, that's why I think the, the book fundamentally fails. And I gave it sort of two and a half uh, in the end, which, you know, it's a prize winner. It should be better than that. Um, do I need to say anything else? Oh, yes. Yeah, so just again, as a final example of, I think, quite, quite sort of disappointing writing, really. Grief manifested itself in ways that felt like anything but grief. So again, this sort of, it's this, but it's the opposite of this, which, as I say, she does a lot. Grief obliterated all feelings but grief. Same again. Grief made a twin wear the same shirt for days on end to preserve the morning on which the dead were still living. Grief made a twin peel stars off the ceiling and lie in bed with glowing points adhered to fingertips. Grief was bad-tempered. Grief was kind. Grief saw nothing but itself. Grief saw every speck of pain in the world. Grief spread its wings large like an eagle. Grief huddled small like a porcupine. Grief needed company. Grief craved solitude. Grief wanted to remember, wanted to forget. Grief raged. Grief whimpered. Grief made time compress and contract. Grief tasted like hunger, felt like numbness, sounded like silence. Grief tasted like bile, felt like blades, sounded like all the noise of the world. Grief was a shapeshifter and invisible too. Grief could be captured as a reflection in a twin's eye. Grief heard its death sentence the morning you both woke up and one was singing and the other caught the song. Again, you know, she's, these are just binary opposites that grief, you know, all she needed to say, and she does say it, and I think this is a really well, you know, great crafted phrase, you know, grief was a shapeshifter and invisible too. But she doesn't need the rest. Let the reader imagine the rest. You know, you've said it in that. But by spelling it out, it's really clunky and it's full of binary contradictions. And it doesn't work. Um, I, I, I was really disappointed in this. You know, I kept reading. I thought, well, where's the Antigone bit? And, you know, by page 190, it starts. I thought, oh, OK. But that seemed to be a different... The whole book had been building up to that. But the, what had come before seemed some curiously detached from it. Because um, it's all about the sort of the, the family relations building up to why the sister... Well, she's a twin. And yes, she had a deep relationship with the brother. Um, and all the rest just seemed to be sort of leading up to that, but in a sort of clunky, overstated way. Um, and as I say, there are good ideas in here, but they're not best served by a rather transparent scaffolding of, of how she uses these characters how she tries to give them depth by saying they're this but they're also the opposite of that or in their reactions to something that's happened or something that's said uh you know when when Issa is talking to 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 Eamon because she meets him before Anika does and there may be something going on on a sort of sexual level but neither of them ever act on it so she goes well he's this but you know he also makes me feel that and it's just it's not good enough. The writing's not good enough to get to page 119, which is where it gets interesting. And where it gets interesting in Antigone, and then you have all this sort of, you know, faux media stuff, which is really quite poorly done, quite caricaturally done. Um, it's a hodgepodge, you know. There's a good book in here, but it's not the book that's been written. Um, so there you have it. Those are the three books that I talk about. Lee Rourke, The Canal. Dennis Johnson, The Largesse of the Sea Maiden. And Camilla Shanzi, Homefire. Okay, thanks very much. Till next time.